Amen. Good evening, clergymen, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and young people in Christ the Lord. And with the love of his mother, the Holy Virgin Mary, be with us this evening. Salam. Welcome, Mishes. Pesawist, Abatoch, Anatoch, Undamoch, Ahetoch, and now. What I touch, the Christos, the Geta Ena, the Ena To, the Kadis Ding Maria, the Lau, the Kerr, Zare, the Meshashe, Kerna, Gere, Yehun. Sema Wulder Manuel now. My name is Wulder Manuel, member of St. Mary of Sarazion Church and host of the talk show Life's Journey. Uh, so, good evening. Welcome back to Life's Journey. And this is, if this is the first time, I welcome you, and I hope you will enjoy the show. Uh, this talk show reveals a personal journey of my guests, starting from their childhood memories up to the present time. Just as a reminder, if you've been watching the show, you probably know what I'm going to say. So well done. The previous shows are available to watch on YouTube and Facebook. My guests so far include Amde Mariam, Diakonwule Mescal, Brahani Mescal, Tafsita Salasi, Gabri Medin, and Rita Mariam, also known as Mama Shirley whose journeys have been recorded and added to the history lesson of our church and community life. I know from the feedback that you're enjoying this new lease of entertainment in the comfort of your home or wherever you happen to be with internet access. Tonight's show, I know will add to your expectations for a warm discussion of my guest's life and work. So tonight's show will take you on a journey from the states of Louisiana, New York, Texas in the USA, Jamaica and London, showing another dimension of the Ethiopian Orthodox Twaido Church in their life's journey of my guest tonight. He's from an exceptionally large family with an extended family, so large that a school was set up with most of the extended family in attendance. His father was the follower of the late Honorable Messiah, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, his philosophy, and as a result, my guest was heavily influenced by him. He was born and raised in the state of Louisiana, where four generations had lived before him. He has eight brothers, four sisters. He's a grandfather to seven grandchildren. He grew up during the Jim Crow law, stating that black, white people were not allowed to mix at all, at all levels in society. Also, police brutality included cars being pulled over, which resulted in riots and uprising in the 60s. In the same year, further riots broke out with 35 people dead. And the chief of police at the time said, and I quote, they are like monkeys in a zoo. During his adulthood, he was harassed by police too, not to mention the Rodney King beating in 1991 after a car chase. As a child going to church, this usually meant going to church twice a day, two different denominations, one to his mother's and again to his father's church. And that means an early morning rise. When not at church, he would go fishing and sometimes listen to the jazz music from the great Miles Davis. His upbringing in the church became unclear and caused a disillusionment in his mid-twenties. Because of it was not addressing the needs of the people and because ministers were preachers instead of teachers. 
He visited the UK a few times during the late 70s and he moved in 2010 to the United Kingdom. A friend of my guest's mother was a Jamaican and as a result he became interested in Jamaican culture and music. The lyrics were, from, uh, were educational and addressing the reasons for the injustice in society at large. This led to him becoming a member of the Rastafari movement, 12 tribes of Israel for five years and growing dreadlocks. It was in a record shop in his hometown with the help of a young lady that he found out the location of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And in 1990, he entered the church for the first time, being the only non-Ethiopian in there. In 1992, he was adopted into the Ethiopian family and seen as one of the brothers and was taught the ways of the church, etc. Then in 1993, he was baptized by the late Archbishop of Una Isaac. Apart from being a member of the church, he taught in the Sunday school also, including cultural positive aspects of living and giving extra support to children from fatherless upbringing. He also worked within the Black Fraternity. He learned to read Amharic. My guest was attending the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Deborah Ginnett, or the Trinity Church. After a few visits, he was told of the English-speaking church, St. Mary of Serazion. And after visiting it, he now feels at home once again and supporting the Sunday School teaching team. And so it's an honor and a privilege to welcome Gabriel Georgis, also known as Robert Kelly, as named by his parents. Welcome to life's journey, Gabriel Georgis. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate the uh, invitation. And then actually, I look forward to uh, being a part of your, sh your show. I, it's much appreciated. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. So, Gabriel Georgis, I've chosen a few points of interest for discussion that will make my listeners pay attention and get them to know you and your journey. Your great-great-grandfather was sold as a child slave from the island of Jamaica. Your uncle was a bishop of a black Protestant church. Your family includes a pianist, a diacon, and a choirist. Take my listeners back to the early days of fond memories as a child growing up in Louisiana in the United States of America with your siblings in a large family and the several visits to different churches in one day. Okay, well, uh, growing up uh, in a large family, uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you have older siblings that uh, help you on your life's journey. They uh, point out different things to you. Uh, they help you in uh, difficult situations. And, and it was just a lot of laughter and joy and love in a, big, in a large family, uh, the large gatherings, uh, especially on Sundays when everybody uh, dressed to go to church. And once you got to church, you met uh, other relatives, cousins, uncles, uh, good friends. Uh, it, was, it was a joy uh, growing up uh, because uh, my older brothers and sisters, they sheltered me from some things, uh, especially uh, some of the prejudice and uh, racial bigotry. Uh, they would shelter me from those things. But as I got older, you know, I was exposed to it and I saw life in that part of the country for the way it was. But besides putting that aside, just growing up in a large family, it was a joy for me, a great joy. Uh, they uh, imparted a lot of wisdom, especially they would uh, share experiences and uh, they would tell me things or, or share mistakes that they made in life so I wouldn't make the same mistakes. Uh, they, um, <clears throat> they became uh, parents and uh, they uh, would 
teach me uh, responsibilities of actually being a parent. Even though I was very young at the time, uh, I saw how they uh, dealt with their children mm -hmm. and, and the way my uh, parents dealt with us. It was, it was a joy. I, I, I love a big family. I, I, I can't think of nothing that's uh, more uh, rewarding than coming from a big family. So much mm -hmm. to learn, so, so, so much to learn. Mm. Did you find that, um, well, first of all, where did you actually fit in that family lineup? Was you in the middle? I was in the, the middle. End? I was in the middle. I was, uh, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I was like number eight. I, I know it's usually complimentary when you have a big house to accommodate everybody so they have their own space. Uh, my experience is usually uh, large families don't seem to have the large space um, to accommodate and give that freedom to individuals. I myself, I grew up in a large family too. And um, I do know that there are the, the pluses and the negative side in relations to large families. So thank you for sharing that, um, uh, Gabriel. Um, if your parents were still alive, um, how old would they be? What's the names of your, your parents? Uh, my father would be uh, 105. And uh, my mother would be 99. Okay. okay. I'm sure my listeners now can get a, a bit more of a, a, a feel for the extended family and that longevity. Um, so, in terms of um, their influence on you, your father, he refused a lot of the negative projection of black people in the media, the films, the books, etc. And he taught you that black people were great inventors and that Tarzan was just a myth to promote yes. white people above blacks. And why do you think your father was called a racist? And and how did they, his guidance or their guidance influence your journey into adulthood? Well, uh, my father didn't trust whites. Uh, he wouldn't allow whites on the property. Uh, because of uh, the experiences he had when he was growing up. And people would say, you're a racist, that's not right. You shouldn't behave that way. And my father said, why not? Look how we are being treated, how we are segregated, uh, how we cannot go to this place or that place. We can't eat here, or we can't eat there. We can't sit down in, in a theater in the same section. He said, that's racism, you know? And uh, so people, my father would say they were just narrow-minded. And uh, they uh, accepted things the way they were, as opposed to trying to bring about some change and stand up for yourself. You know, uh, I was with my father uh, one evening and uh, a gentleman uh, called my father over and he said, hey boy, come here. My father walked in the opposite direction. My father said, you can't be talking to me. I'm older than him, and he's gonna call me a boy? Nah, father wouldn't tolerate that, not at all, from anyone. You know, he, he, he took a position, and he took a stand, and he, and he stood by it, he didn't change. Mm -hmm. And he taught us a lot, and uh, we would share these things t with uh, other kids. They would just laugh at us, they thought we were little little off in the head. But my father was right. He was right. And he so taught during, us a lot. So during your upbringing and during that time when your father was very influential in, in this area, did you find that um, your, that, that area you're growing up in and work, your father's working in, would you say it's um, predominantly of African Americans, or would they not be the majority 
and that includes in the authoritative areas as well, administration? Uh, strictly Americans. Uh, and the, uh, the government in that particular area was uh, 100% white. 100%. Uh, and the, in terms of the population in that particular area, uh, I think it was like 60% uh, white, 40% black. Yeah. Okay, because that, that, that then is a real sort of brave stance that your father took. Yeah, okay. He paid so, a serious price. He paid a price for his stand. Okay. He paid a price. But he was willing to, to pay that price. Mm. Mm. Okay. So would you say in the end that your father had achieved his objectives in raising in, his family? In terms of raising his children, yes, 100%. Uh, trying to uh, bring about some changes in the area, he wasn't quite successful. But raising his children, did a great job, 100%. Okay, thank you for that, Gavin. Now, when you was going through the educational system, uh, there were times you said that you had to spend time away from home, away from the family, and you would then return back when it was end of term, when the school was closed. Um, in addition to that, did you have any memorable teachers? And what career advice did you find useful? Uh, there were a number of, uh, of excellent teachers or instructors. Um, growing up, going, going through the elementary, uh, junior high, and high school, uh, a number of my relatives were teachers. So uh, they played a, a, a big influence on me. They, had, they influenced me a lot. But once I got off to the university, uh, Individuals like uh, Dr. Alvin McNeil, uh, Dr. Freeman, uh, those individuals, uh, they stood out because those two individuals, well, Dr. McNeil, he uh, was an advisor to us when we took a position at the university and we uh, had all of the students to stop going to class because there were some issues at the university that uh, they needed to address. And until they addressed those needs, we were no longer going to class. And Dr. McNeil, he was one of the advisors uh, mm. to us uh, during that uh, demonstration time. And he had huge influence on me. And Dr. Freeman, he had a big, he was a big influence as well. And on, on Returning home after spending time away from the family home, what was that like? Uh, well, my mother was a little upset <laughs> because of the demonstration at the university. Mm. When you don't go to class, you don't get passing grades. So she was a little upset about that. Uh, and people start seeing me in a different light. Uh, they saw me as an activist. Uh, they had different names for us. It calls black militants, you know, names like that, you know. Uh, and so I was thrown in that mix because of the uh, demonstration at the university. And, you know, people thought, sometimes they thought something was just a little bit wrong with me because I didn't, uh, follow the norm you know i chose my own path and didn't allow someone to uh choose my path for me and they thought i had strayed somewhat because of my uh beliefs mm. just going back to the um the demonstration i mean nowadays in our present time demonstration seems to always seem to turn out to be um, um, overhandled uh, by the the law, uh, the police, and so on. Um, 
what was it like back in those days when you were demonstrating? Were, were you allowed to freely demonstrate? Was there no um, uh, coercion or um, abuse by uh, the police and so on? Did you feel not at all. Not, not at all. Uh, my undergraduate work was done at one of the uh, historically uh, uh, black universities. And the town where the university was, it was a black community. So the police officers were black, the mayor was black, because the town in which the university was established was a black community. Right. Now, uh, when we were doing that, uh, that demonstration, and it lasted uh, what, about two or three weeks, and around about the end of the second week, they called the National Guard. That was, there was no violence. Uh, we hadn't done anything uh, to, uh, for them to call the National Guard because it was a peaceful uh, demonstration. Mm. Uh, the only thing that, that we did that they didn't like, uh, we chained ourselves to the administration building. <laughs> and wouldn't allow anyone in. <laughs> we wouldn't allow anyone in. But they called the National Guard, and the National Guard came out, and they just thought it was a little holiday for them. They didn't interfere whatsoever. They didn't. They did nothing to us, other than just chit chat. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was very peaceful, mm -hmm. and we were able to uh, bring about some of the changes that we wanted to see in the university. So it was it was worth it. It was worth it. And what 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 era would that be? What decade was that? Uh, this was in the seventies. Okay. All right. Thank you for that update, Gabri. Um, Gabri, you're a father to seven children. Uh, you're a father to many children and seven yes. grandchildren. Yes. Can you share with us, my listeners, uh, their names and how they're doing? And do you see okay, any of them following in your footsteps? I have three. I have three children, two uh, two boys and a girl. Uh, my oldest, his name is uh, Keenan. Uh, number two son's name is Damian. Number three, my daughter, her name is, is Roxanne, and uh, they're doing extremely well. They all are uh, university graduates, and uh, they are working in their uh, chosen fields. And uh, they're great parents. They are great parents. Uh, they, they raise their children the way my father raised me. Uh, they're always there for their kids. They sit down and they're, they're constantly talking to their kids. They point different things out to their kids. And they raise their children to be givers, not receivers. You know, because a lot of kids, I think, uh, uh, expect rewards for everything that they do and not uh, look at the things that's going on around them and the people that don't have the things that they have. So my children, my sons and my daughter, they, 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 they raise their children to be givers. You need to give of yourself, your time, money if you have it, you know. And so uh, my kids are great. I love my kids. I have some great kids. In my eyes, they're great. That's, they're not perfect by no means, but uh, they're on the right path. My uh, oldest son, <clears throat> he's, uh, he attends the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in uh, Texas. And uh, my youngest son, uh, he attends a church. I can't think of the name of it right now. And uh, my daughter... Uh, she's a uh, she's a Catholic, and she attends the uh, Catholic church. My young grandson here, he's uh he's wanting to come to the Orthodox Church, but his dad is has some issues with the church, so he won't let him attend. Yeah. So that's one grandchild, then, is it? Yes, and I have uh, seven. seven. Uh, but it's five boys, it was, yeah, five grandsons, two granddaughters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, Gabriel. Um, 
now just going back a little bit because during the 60s and, and and even moving forward to today with um black lives matter racism is still a major issue um during your upbringing and your working career as an insurance claims officer how did you deal with some of the effects such as when you were detained after visiting a shopping store would you like to share that with the listeners okay you want the story of what happened well you can you know say well, that i was you. well i was uh, i left my office to uh go pick up a cake a birthday cake for my mom her, her birthday was that weekend and uh i was going to travel from texas to louisiana with the birthday cake and when I uh, walked out of the uh, supermarket, because they had a bakery in the supermarket, uh, I was going to my car and several carloads of cops were blocking me in. And they took me out of my car and had me up against the wall of the uh, supermarket. They claimed that uh, a gentleman that looked like me had just robbed a, uh, a finance uh, store finance uh place mm. and i tried to explain to the officers i gave them one of my cards and i said my office is right across the street why don't you just call and we can resolve this matter they didn't do that they wouldn't allow me to call and uh fortunate enough one of them uh i think my boss came was at that store and he walked out he saw it he identified me and I was in the office working at the time but that experience brought back memories of things that were happening to black folks when I was growing up and so you you say to yourself things are not, have not changed they're still mm -hmm. the same uh, you know black folks are being harassed black folks are being accused of this black folks are being accused of that uh, so what do you do about this? What can we do to stop them from harassing us? You know, do we go to our uh, political leaders uh, to see what they can do? Uh, or do you just retaliate in some, some way, which I, I didn't do? But believe me, things like that went through my mind, you know, uh, you get angry. You want to strike out. Right. You know, so, uh, but what I got from that is to prepare my children for situations like that where they won't get out of hand and my children end up getting hurt. I also teach some of these other young black kids coming up how to deal with situations like that and uh that got me uh more involved into the uh, uh black community working with uh, young kids uh that were growing up we were uh mentors to young young black uh young black kids uh coming up in in that uh houston area and just working with them uh was a joy uh, I, I, one kid, I'll never, ever forget this kid. He was 17 years old, and it was just he and his mom. And he was a piece of work. <clears throat> he kept getting in the trouble at school, uh, fighting, wouldn't go to class. And uh, he got to be uh, a part of that Fifth Ward Enrichment Program, which I was involved in. And we started working with this young man and come to find out he was a genius. The kid went on to finish high school, graduated from uh, the university, and he's a doctor. Wow. He's a doctor to this day. He's a doctor right now. And had no one took an interest in him, he may have been in prison. He may have ended up in jail somewhere. And and uh, that's the uh, the joy for me. That's my reward. My dad told me, uh, if you can save one person in your lifetime, you're doing something. 
You can't, you don't have to, you, you're not gonna save the whole world. But if you save one person, just one, and that one person will make a difference probably in somebody else's life. So that's my reward. Excellent. Okay, Gabriel. Um, now, during the interview, you mentioned that on one occasion you had to write a letter in order to um, address the inequality within a management oh, yes. training program. Could you reflect on that and share with oh, my yes. listeners? What well, the, uh, the company that I was uh, working for, they had um, a recruiting program. And uh, I noticed that uh, they only recruited from predominantly white universities. They didn't go to the uh, historically black universities. So I wrote a letter to uh, management. Well, actually I wrote it to human resource and I wanted to know why. Are you telling me that uh, kids coming out of a black university are inferior? So they got back, uh, they got back to me and uh, they made me a part of the rep recruiting program. And we started recruiting kids from uh, historically black universities. They couldn't come up with a good reason why they were not recruiting uh, kids from predominantly black universities. And I pointed out to them some of the uh, famous uh, uh, black men and women that came from historically black uh, colleges and universities. Uh, the lady, uh, 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 the vice president elect, uh, Sister Harris, she came from a predominantly uh, historically, what's correction, she came from a historically uh, a black university. Martin Luther King, he came from a, a historically uh, black university. So we had a lot of great men, black men and women coming from those universities. That's one of the things that I pointed out to them in the letter. So they have no excuse for not recruiting kids from those universities and they started doing it now that's that that is a, a perfect example of how uh to tackle inequality using the methods that's recognized um and i think that will go down well with a lot of um listeners as well as those who are trying to make their way through the system that there is the appropriate channels to use and the and it's the most effective method. Thank you for that one. Now, um, in 2005, August, uh, the levies broke um, and the there was a great loss of life. And um, although this was quite some distance from where you grew up, nevertheless, New Orleans and um, Louisiana, in Louisiana, was flooded. Um, you lost um, a cousin uh, in this tragedy. Um, what's your thoughts on on that situation? And um, uh, how well, did I was, it well, I was upset the way it was handled, uh, the time it took for the government to get there to provide some relief for the people that were. Uh, damaged as a result of that uh that flood and everybody just referred to us as as a uh, hurricane uh, katrina mm. and uh one of my cousins uh he refused to refuse to leave and a lot of people uh felt the same way and a lot of people lost their lives as a result of that and uh he refused to leave his home and he, he drowned because his home was flooded and uh, he couldn't get out, and and he and he, 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 he uh, and he drowned as a result. And the government they moved so slow. I think Bush was president at the time, and they didn't provide relief uh, for the people in New Orleans. You would see pictures of folks on the top of of, uh, of, of buildings, on the top of their roof of their homes with signs asking for help and for relief. And it took the government a long time before they actually moved in. And, and that was very upsetting. And I felt that if they had gone in there sooner, my cousin may not have died. So that was a real bad taste in my mouth. 
as yeah. a result of the government moving so slow. Mm. Uh, I ask you that because um, we get the media, we get the news, and we get it second, third hand, but it's good to actually get it from yourself who is um, near to that area and have got family living in there. Um, yes, it was a very tragic um, situation. Even over here, we couldn't believe what's going on. Why are black people being treated like this? You know, we just could not believe. And many people died in the process, as you've, as you've highlighted. Um, yeah. Very tragic situation. Yeah, they, okay. referred to, they referred to the people in New Orleans. They called them uh, immigrants. When they were uh, one of the politicians, uh, well, I think it was somebody in Bush's family. Uh, and they were speaking of the uh, people in um, in Louisiana, in New Orleans at the time, and they referred to them as immigrants. Those people were born and raised in New Orleans, and they called them immigrants. That's an insult. <laughs> After all these years, yeah. You're, uh, you're an immigrant. You were born and raised there, and they mm. referred to you as immigrants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bad sure. taste in my mouth behind that handling that situation. Mm. Okay, so um, Gabri, now you uh, visited London and um, you was able to find the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Deborah Gennett, Holy Trinity Church, and um, after a while you realize, um, because someone advised you that um, there is the English-speaking church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, St. Mary of Sarazion. And um, somehow you made your way across to Sarazion uh, and settled into the community quite well, uh, to the point that you are now part of uh, the Sunday school teaching um, staff. Um, what did you discover about the two churches you visited in the United Kingdom? What was your experience? Would you like to share that? Well, I didn't, uh, I grew up uh, in the southern part of, uh, of America. And uh, that was a, as a saying uh, about uh, the southern part of Louisiana, they referred to it as the southern, the southern hospitality. And so when I came here, I was expecting the same thing. You know, greet me, uh, find out what my name is, where I came from, how did I manage to get to the church. I didn't get that. So I was uh, a little disillusioned, I would say. And, uh, if, you know, uh, when I was in church, it, it felt like I was there by myself. You know, even though uh, the church was full to its capacity, it was though I was in there by myself. I didn't get the, the welcome that I expected because of the welcome that I received from the church uh, in Texas. It was totally different. Uh, no one approached me. Uh, no one asked me how did I find the church. No one asked me if I was ever actually uh, baptized in the Orthodox faith. So I was a little disillusioned. And when I made it to uh, St. Mary's, uh, it was somewhat the same. And so I had to take it upon myself to start introducing myself and making conversation with individuals. And they were very friendly. They were very nice. Uh, and I got to meet, I got to meet you after a while. Uh, uh, Holly Merriam, and uh, I got to be very comfortable, but I must say, have you ever, have you ever uh, left home to go somewhere, and it took you a while to get there, but once you arrived at your destination, you knew that was the place for you. 
And that's how it was when I got to uh, St. Mary's. It took me a while to get there, but once I arrived at St. Mary's, I knew I was home. I finally made it home. And that's a great feeling. And it's also a, <laughs> like a relief. And when I got to St. Mary's, it was home. I knew I was home, no doubt about it. Yeah. And the people I met, uh, when I started introducing myself, beautiful people, beautiful people. Uh, and then I began to uh, feel more welcome. Yeah, so it, it, was, uh, it was a great journey. It's interesting to hear that, uh, Gabri Yogis, um, because, like you said, you 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 was accustomed to the hospitality back where you uh, grew up, and um, what we've uh, what we go through here, um, I think, uh, is not quite as in your face as it was in America in that they would make laws that would strictly separate people, especially black and white people. Now, we've had a bit of that here until the race relation came in. And gradually, uh, they weren't in your face about telling you directly you're not allowed here, you can't do this, you can't do that. And um, it's interesting to note that you're now in our part of the world. Um, I mean, your generation obviously is America, descendants from the Afro-American, of course, from Africa. And um, we over here are descendants from the Caribbean. And some of them are actually descendants from this country, going back generations. Of course, we're all Afro, we are African. And, um, what you probably might have experienced is those two coming together, the two different distinct cultural um, interaction. Now, if you didn't come, you probably wouldn't have experienced it. But um, it'd be interesting to know how you are in this re reasonable um, short time, because um, I know you've been active within the church quite a lot here in St. Mary of Sarazion. You've, you've participated in the, the uh, Depth Terrors when you're invited in there. You're busy um, preparing um, the Sunday school programs and so on. And you're very active in the setting up of uh, the church um, altar, etc. So I have a sense that you do feel that you're at home here. And I do hope that that was... Um, a feeling that you will now keep forever, you know? Oh, yes. Thank, oh, yes. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, now, Gabriel, um, you know, we do have listeners who are possibly um, haven't gone down life's journey for a period of time, like yourselves, and uh, are still trying to get through to be successful. Um, what advice would you give a young person or someone who's not quite sure where they're going in life? What um, encouragement, words of encouragement would you give them, my listeners? Well, uh, I would encourage young individuals to uh, not give up on their dream, for one thing. And uh, life's journey is not always that easy. There will be roadblocks. And the best thing, or uh, the, the best book that uh, I would recommend that individuals read is the Bible. Because for every problem that you may encounter in life, there's a solution to that problem in that book and if you embrace if you embrace the bible life's journey will not be as difficult as you 
you as as if you as as you would imagine because the solutions of your problems of your problems are always there and that would be my advice to embrace the bible because the bible has all the solutions for you all you have to do is read it and they're there all the answers that you would ever want in life are right there in that book that's my advice okay thank you for that Gabriel. Gabriel yogis now um you through discussions with you, you you said that you were disillusioned with the protestant churches and as a result you seeked an alternative and um, during this process you uh, discovered the rastafarian movement uh, under the name of the 12 tribes of israel and for some five years he was in this uh, movement growing your dreadlocks and so on and uh, later you became a member of the ethiopian orthodox church now can you share with us that that time that you um, during the time you're finding the Rastafarian movement and during that time within it and to be moving out into the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Okay, well, <clears throat> I began uh, listening to uh, reggae music and I paid close attention to the lyrics. And listening to the lyrics uh, was unlike uh, some rhythm and blues music they were talking about the things that uh, black, black folks were going through. And they also uh, talked about scripture. And I said, you know, that seems a little interesting. I need to look into this further. And a friend of mine in New Jersey was a member of the 12 tribes and he introduced me to the Trail of Tribes there in uh, New York. <clears throat> and uh, I, I joined the Trail of Tribes and uh, we were doing things. We were actually doing things uh, within the community. We had fundraisers and, and uh, the money that was raised, we were using it to, uh, to help some of the, uh, the young kids, but it was, something i just couldn't wrap my mind around i couldn't wrap my head around so i couldn't fully embrace the philosophy and that uh distanced me from the the 12 tribes i just couldn't grasp everything that, that was being taught and uh in the back of my mind it's, it just kept nagging me uh you need to find the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It, is, it just kept bugging me, just rattling around in my head constantly. And until I finally decided I broke away from the uh, 12 tribes. And when I broke, broke away from the 12 tribes, that's when I uh, started seeking out the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And uh, I told you the story uh, how the lady in the record shop got me there. And uh, the very first day uh, I arrived at the church for service, I was out in the parking lot. And uh, one of the members saw me out in the parking lot and said, this guy looks lost. <laughs> so he came over and introduced himself and I told him who I was and what I wanted to do and how I had met the priest. And, and he invited me into the church and he said, sit next to me and I will explain everything for you. And he became my lifelong friend. Very, very dear friend and his family. Uh, we still communicate to this very day. And that's how I ended up at the church. Okay. Now, you, you know, or maybe you don't know, but um, certainly over this side of the Atlantic, um, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel movement, Rastafari movement was very strong. Um, and it was mainly amongst the, the first generation and those who have come in as young adults into this country. 
and find that um, there don't seem to be equality. And the um, Rasta movement was able to engage by using music, the rhythm, as distinct from the popular genres. And then the lyrics, like you mentioned, was you know incorporated in there to also send a message. And it done its job in recruiting. It does that quite nicely uh, because it stood out. It was what was needed. But then, like you've also mentioned, and my previous guests have mentioned too, that um, there comes a point when the maybe the teaching starts to become unclear or is not founded deep enough in, you know, the... Um, you know, the historical context of the teachings within uh, the Bible. And as a result of that, many have left and quite a few of them have actually found the church as a result of that. Understand? So there is that, um, we can relate to that. My listeners, I'm sure, will have a comment uh, and maybe want to say something in regards to this because it is, it is part of our heritage here trying to find our way through the system and uh yeah it is it is a very in interesting area of discussion and i'm sure this will go on as we go through uh this program and when we have our discussion there is a very close connection but they seem to sell a dream and that dream is it's a dream you know for the, for the majority of um, those who followed, it, it's like a dream. One day we will, you know, and then the uh, the other elements that was um, they sort of persecuted you because you weren't allowed to smoke, you know, the marijuana or the weed. So that was another conflict within uh, the society. It's a very um, interesting topic and I'm glad you touched on it you've shown your input from your side from across the Atlantic and I'm sure my listeners will um, you know use that experience and learn it thank you very much Gabri for that one so now Gabri we move on to the part of the show where you will um, share um, three pictures uh, three pictures you've chosen specifically because they have got some significance, and that's, um, and you explain the reasons behind it. So, are you ready for this, Gabra? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So, could you explain well, picture number one, please? Uh, picture number one is uh, a picture of uh, my brother. Uh, he's carrying uh, the tablet, and he's the uh, head priest at the church, and it's Madani Alam in uh, Houston, Texas. And my two nephews uh, are the two young deacons in the front. Uh, and uh, the reason why I chose that is because that's my family. And I just, and I've spoken of my brother a number of different, on a number of different occasions. And I just wanted to share a picture of my brother along with his uh, two kids because they are deeply involved uh, in the church. Uh, Nathan, uh, the young, uh, young, young man, the young deacon on the left, his uh, uh, goal in life is to become a priest. He wants to be a priest. Uh, and um, the one that's on the left, he's, uh, he has another, another two years, another year, and he'll be enrolling in uh, medical school. So I'm very proud of my nephews. Uh, the one on the left, which his name is Nathan, uh, he, uh, he graduated from the university. Uh, he was offered a scholarship to uh, in, uh, enter medical school, but he changed his mind because uh, he said, I want to be a priest, you know. And uh, his calling, according to him, he said, I have a calling for spiritual healing. You know, and so, you know, so I'm very proud of them, and that's why I'm, I share that picture because I talk about them all the time. 
right. and I tell everybody in church about them. So I just wanted them to see what they look like. Okay. Now the uh, next picture, uh, these are kids from my Sunday school class. And, I'm, and I'm, the reason why I'm so proud of uh, that picture, th those kids have gone on to be, well, one young lady, uh, she's an architect. Uh, uh, some of the others, uh, engineers, uh, accountants. And I want to thank that uh, I had some influence on them in terms of uh, furthering their education and uh, becoming uh, young professionals. And also, those kids, they have not left the church. They have gone on off to the universities, uh, obtained their degrees, but they stayed in the church. And uh, I like to think I had played a little, played a little part in, in, in doing that, in helping them uh, stay in the church and uh, become young, young professionals. And at and what age did you? At what age did you kind of pick them up and started mentoring and teaching them? Okay, I started off with young teenagers, and my age group was uh, kids from uh, junior high to high school, and we're talking about from thirteen all the way up to seventeen. Okay. And uh, and then I started teaching younger kids. So I had two classes. I would teach the older kids first, and then I taught the uh, the younger kids, the young kids that were like elementary school. Uh, I think what, what I think y'all call that. What's the first primary. year? He, primary. The first, primary, I think it was primary. Primary. Yeah, and uh, I started uh, teaching them as well. And uh, I was really proud of those kids. Very, very, very proud of them. They are young professionals. Some of them were deacons in the church, became deacons in the church. So uh, I just want to think that I played a little part in that. And the uh, last picture uh, I took is with the priest at uh, uh, St. Michael's in Dallas. And for the life of me, I've been trying to think of his name and it, 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 it escapes me. Uh, but he took an interest in me when I was at St. Michael because uh, I was at Madonna Allen first, but then my job transferred me to another city. And uh, I ended up in Dallas and I started attending uh, St. Michael's and I was teaching, still doing Sunday school teaching there because they had heard of me from Madonna Allen in Houston. Cause they used to, churches would visit each other on certain holidays and, uh, and they, and they uh, told them about the work that I was doing in Houston and they asked me to do the same thing when I got to Dallas. And that priest, uh, he would, uh, on Saturdays, he would uh, have a, a, taught me the ways of the church and explain the Kadasi. He broke the Kadasi down for me and he explained the different stages of the Kadasi and what it meant. Uh, and he and I would talk all the time. After service, uh, he would seek me out and chat with me. And his son was also a, a priest at the church. So I was, uh, I was thankful for him to be a part of my life. And uh, he helped me uh, spiritually a lot. And that's why, I, and for the life of me, I can't think of his name. And probably when I get through talking to you, it's going to come to me. Yeah, but uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a good teacher. Very, very good teacher. He opened my eyes to a lot of things. Because, you know, you go to, if you ask the average uh, individual that's sitting through the Kadasi to explain it, and they, and they could not explain that Kadasa to you. Mm -hmm. Of course. But he took time and explained everything to me. He broke it down. Right. And he explained the Kadasa to me. And, and um, to know the Kadasa, the meaning of the Kadasa, 
why you do things, why they do some of the things uh, doing the Kadasi. It's a beautiful journey. It's something that you look forward to because uh, you start from Adam and Eve and then from the birth of Christ all the way up to the resurrection. It's a beautiful journey. And I think everybody should, should understand it and appreciate it. Because I know yes. I do. Yeah. Yeah, see, it just goes to show that um, education is the key. Which, whichever sphere you look at, education, being taught, given that knowledge to continue the process, uh, the positive process is so vital. Thank you for sharing your pictures, Gabriel. Um, oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Okay. So, Gabriel Gorgis, I would like to thank you for sharing your life's journey and the photographs with our listeners which, you know, this includes national and international viewers. And um, I also would uh, like to wish you and your family the best and have many more years of service to give to the church, to be that beacon of uh, direction for those who are coming after us. And Gabriel, um, all this journey has been well worthwhile, well worth telling. So thank you for that. And one of the things that I, I, I wanted to mention, but I, 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 uh, I failed to do so, I did a book on my family's history. And uh, in the book, uh, they had, I had photographs of our ancestors, uh, a good history of the family and different names that have changed over the years through marriages. Uh, and I gave one to my, uh, all of my siblings so they could share with their children. That way they'll know where they were, where their roots, roots are. You know, who were their ancestors? What role did their ancestors play in their journey? You know, and I, I, I failed to mention that. I, I did a book and I gave it to all of my siblings to share with their children. And I even gave some to some of my cousins so they can share with their children as well. See, this is where you came from. This is where it all began for us. These were the people that are responsible for where we are today. And there's an African uh, saying that uh, I, don't, I, uh, I don't have the quite quotation. Uh, it says that remember, wherever you are in life, you got there on the shoulders of the people that came before you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and that's one of the things I try to, I try to stress in the book. Like these people made sacrifices so you can be where you are today. They had to put up with things that you wouldn't tolerate. Some of the uh, injustices that they endured just so you can be here today and be successful. And so your success is off the shoulders of somebody else that came before you. So and that's, and I wanted to stress that wanted my kids to stretch that to their children and they can pass it on to their children, you know? Thank you, thank you, brother. Uh, <clears throat> and I pray that uh, the listeners uh, could get one little something out of this conversation that uh, you and I have had that may be able to help them in their life, in their life's journey. So it's a blessing for me just to be a part of your show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you once again. Well, we're at the end of the, another great show, and it's been a life journey well told by our brother, Gabriel Georgis, who originally is from across the Atlantic Ocean. And I would like you, my listeners, uh, to feel a sense of attachment to our brother and motivated to keep our history and to move forward with confidence that we are not alone on our journey. I would like to thank the producer of this program and that God continues to inspire the production team so that we can have more shows for the future. 
for the next show i will have my guests lined up so please remember friday um, is our day when we are going to view and show this program oh and uh, if you haven't already done so please click the thumbs up don't forget to subscribe and please share share your comments and um this is Wolde Emanuel saying good night sleep well may god be praised until we meet again god bless amen amen